Good morning, everyone. My name is Noe Juarez, for those who are maybe visiting this morning, and welcome to each of you. My job is to introduce Dennis, so please, Dennis, could you come forward? Uh, Dennis Smith and Maribel serve in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and he is currently the coordinator of the South American Mission Partnership for the PCUSA, which means he gets to travel to all the South American countries to accompany and to help and support all the mission ministries that happens in Colombia, Peru, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, I'm forgetting other countries, Bolivia, Ecuador, Uruguay, Guyana, you don't do Guyana, no. okay. Paraguay, yes. Paraguay, yes, okay. So, and Dennis also, he, two months ago, he just became, for the first time, a, a new a grandfather. So, that's, that's great. Congratulations. Thank you. Yep. So, so, today, we welcome uh, Dennis into our uh, Highland congregation. Also, after service, this, after this service right now, we are invited to have um, some, if you didn't sign up for lunch, you can still get some lunch somewhere else and come back and join us in a, for Dennis' uh, conversation at the choir room. So I hope you can join us for that. So Dennis, welcome to Highland Presbyterian Church. Gracias, mi hermano. Bienvenido. Gracias. Gracias. Good morning. It's great to be back at Highland, and I've got to give a credit to Aruma. She's the Siamese cat that invaded on our space. You know, if you ever tried to get a cat to do that, it would never happen. And of course, we did not invite her, and so she was just there. Yeah. I'll get to the scripture reading in just a minute. Um, one of the things that Maribel and I love about Highland is that you take mission partnership seriously. And we'd have, we've had the joy of receiving a couple of groups from here in recent years, most recently. As Noe mentioned, the Peru trip last June, where uh, Mari and I were able to accompany you on visits to Cusco and Machu Picchu, and we even made it to the top of Huaynu Picchu, so it was quite an endeavor. Thank you for supporting our ministry, for being part of our extended family as we serve together in God's mission. This has been one of those weeks. Uh, last weekend, I was at a small church near Amherst, Massachusetts. And then on Tuesday, I was off to Medellin for a consultation with the Presbyterian Church in Colombia. They have been our mission partner in Colombia for more than a century. And they're deeply involved in the peace process there, proclaiming the gospel and working for healing and reconciliation after six decades of civil war. And then on Friday, back to Louisville, where we're based during this time in the U.S. Uh, did you get the correct pronunciation? Louisville. Louisville. Yeah. Um, and yesterday, back to the airport to spend this time here with you. And so Friday evening, I'm at the airport in Newark, awaiting the flight back to Louisville. I'd left for the airport in Medellin at 4 o'clock that morning. And it was now 9 o'clock at night, and I'm talking to my son on the phone, and, 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 and suddenly I think that I don't know where my phone is. And I'm, I'm talking, and I'm going through my jacket pocket, and pants pocket, and pockets on my backpack, and then suddenly it hits me, I'm talking to my son on the phone. You never have senior moments like that, do you? Thank God for a good night's sleep once I got back to Louisville. And despite the frenzied schedule and my frazzled brain, all this week I've been thinking about these remarkable texts that we have before us this morning. And I've been thinking about this great privilege of spending these last 40 years as your representatives in God's mission in Latin America. As we approach the word this morning, let us pray. Creator God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The first text this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew. Chapter 5, the first 12 verses, 
that very familiar passage known as <clears throat> the Beatitudes. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The second text this morning is from the Revelation, chapter 7, verses 9 through 17. After this, I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white, with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne, and around the elders, and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne, and worshipped God, singing, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me saying, Who are these robed in white and where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one that knows. And then he said to me, these are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of the water of life. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Sisters and brothers, this is the word of God to us this morning. Forty years, as I look back, I can affirm that God is good and life is rich, but it never stops being complicated. In 40 years of mission service, I have learned that life hurts, and no matter who you are or where you live, life includes brokenness. Yet in our brokenness, God walks with us. God is good. God is present. God is merciful. And with fierce tenderness of spirit, God gathers us up and makes us whole. And in this process, we learn that we are not alone. 180 years ago, the Presbyterian Church USA began to reach out in mission service to the whole world. We began sending mission workers to Latin America in the 1840s and 1850s. 
And in all this time, we have learned together that we form part of a global community called to faithfulness, called to service together. We have come to understand that the gospel does not belong to us. It belongs to God. And that is why today, if we are to be faithful to the gospel, we are called to work together with mission partners all over the world. This week, churches all over the world celebrated that day in 1517 when Martin Luther nailed those 95 theses to a church door in Wittenberg. And this week we have affirmed that the church is reformed and always reforming. Precisely because God is not subject to our rules. Every time we seek to trap God in an institutional box or domesticate God's spirit every time we try to settle down and get comfortable and self-satisfied, God slips from our grasp. And when that happens, we remember that we must seek God's face on the margins of society among the abused and excluded. As Presbyterians, we join in God's mission not because we have the answers, but because together with our partners, we are learning who and where God is in our world. Because our communities continue to experience unexpected loss and change and conflict, we need to experience God's healing together. Matthew's Gospel was written in the closing years of the first century when Christians were suffering serious persecution. In the year 70, Jerusalem had been destroyed in war with the Romans and the early Christian community was struggling to find its place in a violent and fast-changing world. Most Christians had abandoned Jerusalem prior to this debacle. Some had settled in Pella across the Jordan River. Others had dispersed throughout Syria and to Antioch. Of course, Most of the Jerusalem Christians were Jewish, and their sudden displacement brought difficulties of adaptation and assimilation, sorting out roles between new Jewish and Gentile believers, both persecuted and huddled in exile, cannot have been easy. During these decades, these believers that Matthew is addressing, both Jewish and Gentile, had valiantly confronted tribulation, confident that Jesus' triumphant return was imminent, that the bad guys would be defeated, and that peace and justice would finally reign. And today's texts calls these folks blessed. Those who mourn, the poor in spirit, those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Such a simple word, blessed. When a related word is used in the Old Testament, they translate it into English as happy. As in, happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked in Psalm 1. Or, happy are those who take refuge in God, in Psalm 2. Or, happy are those who observe justice and practice righteousness, in Psalm 106. In Spanish, the word used in Matthew 5 for blessed is bienaventurados or bienaventuradas. And in English, that would be more or less good adventure to you. Or these folks are given a role in a great adventure. Now, Matthew is not talking here about warm fuzzies, but about those who long to follow God's word, who seek the justice of God. Other people, 
may wallow in the trappings of material success, but that is not real blessing, real happiness, for it does not reflect the things that are important to the Creator. For example, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Present tense, blessed. They are blessed now. They feel themselves to be part of a great adventure in, in part because they see the big picture. They, they know that the world they see around them does not correspond to the ultimate realities of God's reign. And their inheritance is secure. In the same chapter, Matthew will recall that Jesus had other difficult teachings like turn the other cheek or love your enemies. And this great adventure that Jesus proposes is a way of life that motivates moral behavior and deep humility. It motivates people to seek justice and to love mercy. And when you have gone on mission trips, you have sensed this blessing, this happiness in the people you have met. It is their gift to you as your partners in God's mission. A few weeks ago, I was in Urabá Presbytery in Colombia, not far from the border with Panama. I visited perhaps eight or nine churches there. It's a region that has been devastated by conflict for 60 years. Pastors and elders of those churches told me that 80 to 90 percent of their current congregations were people who had been forced to flee their homes because of violence. Yet they know themselves to be part of a great adventure. Their lives are complicated. The hurt is real. Yet together they are building the world dreamed by God. Matthew's community knows that this story leads to law, to, to the cross. Yet somehow, in the world dreamed by God, death itself, absolute brokenness, yields to resurrection. In the text from the book of Revelation this morning, John gives us more insights into God's dream. A great multitude of all peoples from all places speaking every tongue stands before God giving thanks that God's grace is sufficient. Salvation belongs to our God. Nowhere does John advocate that we seek out suffering. He never suggests that suffering is a prerequisite for joining that multitude. On the contrary, we here find that God's uh, response to the human predicament is not to abandon us. God's, God will shelter God's people and wipe away every tear and God's people will hunger and thirst no more. And God's action becomes a model for our action. We must not abandon one another. We are called to shelter God's people, to weep with those who weep and mourn with those who mourn in the understanding that we are not alone, that we are called to bear one another's burdens, whether that is in Peru or Cameroon or right here in Lancaster. This multitude also brings to mind the great cloud of witnesses that accompany us on our journey. We have honored some of them this morning and their presence continues to sustain us. As we approach this table this morning, we remember, remember, 
that Jesus was broken for us to challenge the power of death itself. We approach this table in the knowledge of our own brokenness, knowing too that God's grace is sufficient. God dreams, and together we are being made whole. I don't know quite what that means for you, but I know that in my own faith journey there have been times when God has gone silent. And then I witness through our mission partners how God is loose in today's world. Somehow that is enough. Somehow we hold one another accountable. And somehow we nourish hope in one another. Most of all, in this broken, fragmented world, we as Presbyterians understand that we are not alone. We are part of a global community of Christians who with all people of goodwill are nourished by hope, risk all in pursuit of peace with justice. God dreams. And around this table, we are being made whole.